being poor is a sin. Now, before you get mad at me, before you log off and run away, <laughs> allow me to explain. Good morning from Miami. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever else in the world you might be watching from. Uh, please check in on the chat and just say, hey, and let me know where you're watching from. Let me get my chat set up here. If I can put it on the uh, merge to meeting window. Okay. We got a gorgeous looking crowd here as usual. Oh, and Michael Burton is finally back on live after, you know, two, three weeks of being playing hooky. Don't think I didn't notice that. Okay. We got Paula, Jose, and Jorge, who are my esteemed colleagues in creative chaos who keep this show coming to you. I see Jedi Romano in the house, also coming from Florida. Uh, Luis de Bianco, great to see you, mi amigo. Derek Lord, a, a blast from the past, good to see you here. Uh, great crowd. And we got uh, Jidi Akanbi, who I notice every single week. So good to see you here. <laughs> All right. so. Being poor is a sin. Uh, I want to talk about that in a minute. But again, first, uh, if you're just so you know, we do this every Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, the time recently changed here in the States a week or so ago. That's why it's earlier, an hour earlier for some of you in other places of the world. Uh, but tell a friend about it. Uh, and uh, share the show. And then every Monday we do the, we repost it on the Power Prosperity podcast on audio and Prosperity TV, my YouTube channel. The video is usually up by the end of the day on Monday as well. Um, and that's part of your cost to attend. If you're new here, we do this on a love offering basis, which means just pay whatever you believe it's worth. It's a for-profit prosperity ministry where we explore a lesson every week and study the principles of prosperity, free enterprise, and um, generosity. And so I'm doing this as a for-profit ministry to model the behavior, to model the principles that uh, we're talking about. Um, so please tell your friends about it, share the YouTube show, share the podcast. Um, now, so one of the things I wrote in the email was, uh, uh, you know, it, you know, with this title, uh, that if you're still poor at the moment, don't get angry. Just please watch the broadcast, the whole broadcast. And, I promise you'll thank me later. I really, uh, truly believe that. So where do I get off coming up with a title like that? Being poor is a sin. Uh, for the record, I was very poor for a very long time. So please don't make the assumption I was born in a wealthy family and I don't understand struggle and uh, I haven't experienced poverty and I don't know what it means to not have enough money to eat, uh, to have my lights cut off by the power company, to have Christmas roll around and not have money to buy presents. I have lived all of those realities. And I will be the first to tell you that is a sin that I was living in sin when I was living in lack and limitation. And I believe each and every one of us in the world, when we are living in lack and limitation, we are living in sin. My real job, my day job, I'm an author. I write books. So because I'm an author, words are really important to me. So I want you to understand, because I got a lot of blowback, right? I've been posting for a week on what the lesson would be. And I've heard from more than a few people 
more than a few who are near dear friends. Uh, how can you use that language? That's rude, that's demeaning, that's insulting. We need to do better. Uh, but I chose that word very mindfully. And here's why. Um, when we think of sin for the biggest majority, I think on the planet is probably the Christianity majority. And they define sin from the biblical context, right? It's all about the Bible is all about what is a sin, what is not a sin. But of course, we read the Bible, the vast majority of us who have read it, we read it through translations. And those translations were interpreted by other people. The actual, what we know as the Bible today, the original document was written in Aramaic. And the Aramaic definition of sin means to miss the mark. And that's why I think this word is very appropriate in this context, because I believe when you or I are living in lack or limitation in any way, we're missing the mark of our creator, if you believe in a creator, or of our destiny, our evolution, what we are here on this planet to become. So when we're poor, we're missing the mark. When we have poverty, as we do in humanity, widespread systemic poverty around the world, we're missing the mark as a civilization. We are sinning as a civilization. Many of you have also studied the Course in Miracles. I studied the Course. I found that was very helpful for me. Uh, and you know how the Course in Miracle defines sin? The definition for the Course is a lack of love. And see, I think that also would be a magnificent and appropriate definition of poverty and being poor is it's a lack of love. But here's where I'm going to be really different than a lot of people who teach prosperity principles. Um, I'm not going to look for the outside victim. I'm not going to look for the systemic bias. I'm not going to look for who is doing what to us as uh, victims of poverty. I'm always going to direct the focus on self-responsibility, self-awareness, self-reliance. How do we change that reality? How do we take control of the situation uh, of this lack of love that society has shown us. If we've created barrios in San Salvador and Sao Paulo and Liberty City and Overtown and Compton and India and Sub-Sahara Africa, and we have so many places of lack, limitation, poverty, suffering, disease. Look at Brazil right now with the uh, coronavirus pandemic. That is a sin because we're missing the mark in Brazil. We have a lack of love in Brazil. And when you're just a single mother, I don't let me say just, that's a horrible, cancel, cancel, cancel. When you're a single mother raising a child or children and you're struggling to meet the, the needs of your children, that's a lack of love. It's a lack of love from society, but we've got to we've got to find a way to say, how can you open up that gateway? How can you open the door to allow that love to come in, to allow prosperity to hit the mark instead of miss the mark? And then I'm going to give you one more definition of sin. And this particular one is my own personal definition of sin. I believe a sin is 
when we commit a crime against the force that created us. And that's what I believe poverty is. That's what I believe struggling and being poor is. And it's not just about money, by the way. Uh, when I say being poor, uh, we're going to follow the, the, the general teaching we do here every week, the holistic definition of prosperity, health, happiness, empowering relationships, money and material things, a uh, strong spiritual connection. All of those things make up prosperity. And when we're lacking in any of those things, I believe it's a sin. And I believe that sin is a crime against the force who created us. And you know me, this is, this is not a church. I call this the prosperity unchurch. We have an unchurch service here every Saturday, right? Because um, I don't, I choose not to participate in the doctrines and the dogma, in the labels, because those things are meaningless to me. I'm looking for us to concentrate on the, the first principles. Remember, we did a, a lesson one week on this, on the first principles of prosperity. Because when we go back to first principles, this is where we start to find solutions. And that's what this broadcast is about every week, finding solutions. I don't do this to beat you up, to social signal, status signal, to boost my viewership. I do this because we, we've got to find solutions for these things. And that's what my work has been about for almost 25 years now, maybe 30, is how do we solve these crimes against the force that created us? So when I say the force that created us, I, if you call it God, Yahweh, Jesus, Buddha, nature, energy, evolution, destiny, none of those labels matter to me. I'm only interested in the outcome, which is you should be living a life of abundance. You were born to be healthy. You were born to be happy. You were born to seek significance and wellness and abundance in all things. Very important. I wrote a, a, a newsletter about this yesterday and I, I got so, you know, I woke up kind of late. I woke up at like 7.30, 7.45 and my DMs, my texts, my WhatsApp were filled with messages about my Friday philosophy newsletter. I queue that up so it goes out about 2 a.m. Eastern. So I woke up and my, my phone was blown up with all these messages. But, oh my God, that Friday philosophy, you have to put that on your blog. You have to share that with people. That's the best one you've ever written. And one of the things I talked about was suffering because there is this um, misconception in, in, the, in the new thought movement, in the religious movement, in the self-development movement that somehow if we say enough Hail Marys, rub enough rosary beads, burn enough incense, affirm enough affirmations, think positive enough, we will never struggle again. And we can watch this secret and our Lambo is just going to drive itself right up in our driveway. That's crazy talk. That's magical thinking. And people who fall prey to that magical thinking, um, they have a very rude wake up call at some point. Because you and everyone you know recently came out of suffering, is currently in suffering, or is about to experience suffering. Because it's all in the game, yo. It, Part of birth is death. Part of wellness, uh, wellness and health is disease and sickness. And, you know, I predictably, I got some comments on the social media and the blog and like, how can you, and one of the things I mentioned that I had been laying down for three days in pain from, I injured my back playing softball and practice last week. And then I played on Sunday because we really needed a win. And I put myself 
in the lineup after because uh, another guy was missing. He missed a plane and I would have had to play with one short player. So I put myself back in the lineup and I played. And so I'm always amused because people chastise me whenever I blow my nose. Like, how do you have a cold? Do you have allergies? How does a prosperity conscious guy have a cold? How does a prosperity conscious guy have a, a spinal injury? How does your mother die if, you're, if you have prosperity consciousness? And we're gonna really deal with this next week in the lesson. I'm already planning next week's lesson about overcoming to become. And the reality of struggle in our life, which means sometimes we will be poor, sometimes we will be in lack, right? That people who think, um, you know, no, if you just think positive, you will never be sick and you will live forever. I'm sorry, Bubba, it doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Who had more prosperity consciousness than Charles and Myrtle Fillmore? They still died. Who knew more about the science of mind than Ernest Holmes? He's dead too. You know, what a magnificent uh, work Dr. Wayne Dyer did on the power of the mind and how we can uh, visualize and create our reality. He still got leukemia. He still died of a heart attack. And you know what? I'm doing all the amazing work I can in prosperity consciousness, and I'm still going to die at some point. <laughs> okay? And I still got a flat tire in my gorgeous limited special edition Evoke Range Rover that was personally designed by Victoria Beckham for Land Rover. There's only three in the United States of America. I have one of the three and I got a flat tire on it the other day, even though I'm a prosperity guru. <laughs> it happens. That's all part of the game, right? But it's what, what a prosperous life is about is recognizing that we all will struggle at some point. We all will face illness or disease at some point. We all will face death at some point. Um, Paula, my lovely co-host who takes care of you guys every week and puts up the slide, she has a special needs child, right? She can get her positive mental thinking book and read it and she can listen to her positive podcast. Her child still has special needs. And that's one of the struggles that she will have. And it's also one of the greatest blessings she will ever have in her whole life. The fact that she is nurturing and raising that special needs child. Uh, that's what it's about. The fact that we are caretakers for our elderly parents, that we lose beloved family pets, that we lose loved family members, that we face down bad, tough medical diagnoses, that we sometimes struggle for money, material things, healthy relationships, uh, fight addictions. These are all part of the journey. And the journey is finding a way to hit the mark, finding a way to accept the abundance, finding a way to receive the love and finding a way to honor that force which has created us. Let me just check uh, if I have considered... Oh, <laughs> thank you, Luis. I'm just checking the messages, making sure I'm, nobody got locked out or anything like that. Um, okay, good. So, all right. Now, let's talk about how to avoid being a sorry sinner, right? Isn't that what the Bible thumpers and the fundamentalists tell us? We were born a sorry sinner. Um, so how do we avoid that? Because if I'm saying that being poor is a sin, that means if we're still poor, we're a sorry sinner. Uh, and by the way, there's no crime in being born poor. I was born poor. Many of you on this broadcast were born poor. Thousands of you watching this on the replays will have been born poor. 
the crime, the sin, the miss, the mark, the lack of love is if we remain poor. And that's the challenge you give me a yo thumbs up or something in the if you got all right, great love seeing the the participation here. Uh, so how do we avoid becoming a or being remaining a sorry sinner? I have some thoughts on this. First, we've got to blow up the belief that it's spiritual to be poor. Because this is one of the most insidious, pervasive lies that organized religion has taught people for literally centuries that there is some nobility, that, that, that it's spiritual, that you are closer to God, that you are closer to heaven, that you are closer to an enlightened being if you are poor. That dog don't hunt, all right? You gotta blow up that belief forever because that belief is not serving you. Second thing that comes to mind, you have to envision the spiritual good that you can do when you are wealthy. We kind of touched on this in the lesson last week. Uh, and by the way, all the lessons are available. You can always review them uh, on uh, randygage.com. On the homepage, you can, there's a bar. It says, watch the prosperity live stream. I believe it's just randygage.com prosperity hyphen live stream. Um, and we have all the replays there. And again, you can also find them on the, uh, on the podcast, right? So, but we were talking about this a couple of lessons ago. Thanks, Paula, put it up on the stream. That's where all, oh, that's the homepage. You can, if you want to bookmark that, you should, uh, because that's the homepage for the live streams each week. And so you can see what the lesson is that week. You can see what time it is. We have a time zone converter so you can find out what it means on your local time zone. And we have all the replays hosted there as well. So you can watch any of the previous lessons. So um, one of the things I mentioned in that the, the previous lesson was for some of you, the only way you have such worthiness issues that you can't allow yourself to be prosperous for and of yourself because you don't believe you're worthy of it. So you, for you, some of you, we have to work through the process of you becoming wealthier so you can help other people because you want to help other people, but you're not willing to help yourself. This is a very common thing, by the way. I see it a lot with the people I work with. Um, so um, think of that, envision that, really map that out. What can you do with money and resources? What spiritual work can you do? I think of, you know, I support charity water, digging wells for people in Africa that don't have uh, and other places as well that don't have drinkable, potable water. Uh, I think of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which I've supported a lot in the past. I think of a, 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 an endowment that uh, I uh, support that buys the rainforests from the indigenous people and turns them into nature preserves so they don't get sold off to developers. Um, I think of just sponsoring the opera and you know the free tickets we give to kids in school to expose them to classical music, the Young Artists Program, the San Diego Asian Film Festival that I'm a lifetime benefactor of, the, um, the, the Real Voices. It's a, a kind of a, a video program for aspiring teen directors, the work I do speaking it it in prisons and jails to at-risk kids and kids who are incarcerated. Um, that's the kind of stuff you can do when you're wealthy that maybe you can't do when you're poor. So for some of you, it's gonna be really important to do that visualization work. 
to reframe your wealth with what you can do. Because remember, there's so much insidious mind, there are so many insidious mind viruses that um, people do bad things with money. And you've got to blow that up. Or let me write a note here of something else I just thought of we got to talk about today that just happened yesterday. Um, and then the third thing I say is, is you got to commit to becoming the highest possible version of yourself. And that's why I say if you're not manifesting prosperity and abundance, it's a crime against the force who created you because you're not doing what you're not becoming who you are meant to become that highest possible, most enlightened version of yourself and the good you can bring to the world. So let me speak a little about this, this, uh, this reframing process, all right? Get a little sip of my tea. So uh, one of my good, good friends, Tim, posted on my Facebook yesterday. I put the title up, Being Poor is a Sin. Uh, and he wrote a comment that, you know, please rethink this. this. This title is very insulting. And other people chipped in. And I heard the same thing on Twitter and, and uh, other places. Um, and then, so one of the, the things he, t and, and I told him, like I told everyone else, if you're offended by that title, don't get mad at me, just watch the broadcast and then talk to me afterward if you're still mad at me. But I don't think you'll still be mad at me if you actually take the time to watch the broadcast. So, uh, and one of the things he said in the conversation under his comment was, he thought that me selecting that title was rude and in poor taste. So I challenged him to watch and I don't think he's watching. Let me just see. I didn't see him. Let's see if you're watching Tim wave at me. Let me go to the next page. I don't see him. Next page. I see Jedi Bob Berg is in the house. Good to see you my friend. Next page. Um, I don't see him. <laughs> so, uh, what, you know, it's very easy to judge by titles, but are we going to go in and let's see, hopefully he's watching the replay. So, but the thing he said is it was rude and in poor taste. And I said, not only do I want you to watch the show, but let me give you some bonus homework because that was his word, poor taste. I said, now that's interesting because I assume that poor taste is the opposite of good taste, right? If somebody is a aficionado of fine music and culture and the arts, we say they have good taste or they have elegant taste or they have tasteful taste. But if somebody doesn't have good taste, we might say they have bad taste, right? So, but he didn't even say bad taste, he said poor taste. So if poor taste is the opposite of good taste, then we have to assume that the connotation that he has ascribed to the word poor is that it's bad. So my question to him and to anyone who might have been offended by the title, and yes, of course I'm trying to rile up you with the title and make sure you watch. I'm, I plead guilty as charged. Of course, that's what I do. That's what a great teacher does is they challenge his or her students in a way that gets them to look at the lesson. So if he or anyone else, any of you are assigning the value of bad to poor taste, then you've got to question that. Why do you see poor as bad. And I would, I would posit because poor is bad. It's horrible. It sucks. It's a sin. 
It's a crime against humanity. It's a crime against the force who created you. Um, Jackie, I was having a great conversation with Jackie on Twitter. Jackie's been in the, the unity movement for about 20 years. Uh, and she brought up a good point. She said, you know, is that really the sin that people are poor? Or is it the sin that such a huge percentage of jobs have low wages? And the real problem is greed. And then the thing that happened yesterday that I just, uh, you know, made that note to myself was uh, Amazon and Senator Elizabeth Warren got in a uh, Twitter feud yesterday uh, about how wealthy, I don't know if she was referring to just Bezos himself or the company as a whole and the greed of Amazon and versus, you know, so they went back and forth. So I think there's a great conversation to be had in those areas, right? I think if you follow my work for a long time, you know, I wrote a, a, a blog that went viral. I mean, all over the world, uh, just crazy traffic uh, where I said, you know, I have been arrogant and stupid and, and, and believe like, okay, if, just, if we just be more libertarian and just let the free enterprise system work its magic, it will provide for everybody on earth. But I feel like that was really born of arrogance and ignorance um, on my part. Jorge, see if you could find that. I, I'm thinking the title was, I've been ignorant, arrogant, and stupid or something, but you'll remember that post. Try and search the blog if you could. And if you, if you find it, please post it in the comments, in the chat for people. Uh, uh, if you type in the search, I have been arrogant, it'll probably, the autofill will probably pull it up. Um, I, don't, I don't have that arrogance any longer. I don't believe we can just say, okay, the free enterprise system will take care of everything. If we just remove all the restrictions and all the onerous government regulations and let people make as much money as everybody can, there will be so much abundance, we'll take care of everyone. I don't believe that anymore. I, I do believe that we do have to have safety nets. And then I do believe that is a viable role for government, if we're all going to agree to live under one flag and one brand uh, and a set of laws, and we're going to tax ourselves and pay the treasury to support the government, that one of the things that government can do is to provide. There are mentally ill people. There are homeless people. There are mentally ill homeless people. They will fall through the cracks of the free enterprise system. We have to, I think Jorge found it. Um, yeah, thank you, Jorge. Um, so guys, click on that link in the chat and uh, save it so you can read it afterward. I think it'll be a great uh, follow-up homework for you. Um, so I do believe we have a responsibility as humankind to look out for the people who cannot look out for themselves. Um, so I do believe that's a vile, and I think that's a great conversation to have. But why I chose the title of this talk and why I pushed back on Jackie and Tim and Senator Warren and everyone else is, I, while I think that's an important conversation, that isn't the one I wanted to have today. The conversation I wanted to have with you today is the one to say, yes, there is inherent bias in the system. There just is. If you were born where I was born, with the mother I was born with, um, in the family I was born with, there's an inherent bias against me. I can also say there's less inherent bias against me because at least I was born in a white family in the United States, and there's less bias against white families than there are families of color. Um, so, but I was a, a child of a single mother, poor mother, uh, thrown out of high school, teenage alcoholic, teenage drug addict, in jail for armed robbery when I was 15 years old, right? I, I had um, some shots against me, some strikes against me. And though I was able to turn my life around 
And that's what I want to focus this conversation on is how each and every one of us chooses to not become a victim. It would have been very easy for me to become a victim. It's very easy for you to become a victim. You've got to fight that with every fiber of your being. Because you've got to, you've got to say, okay, yes, there is an inherent bias in the system. There is, if you're, uh, and this is, I mean, here's what I want you to understand. This is really, really important, really important, guys. If you are poor, you're more likely to die of cancer, heart attack, diabetes, stroke, sickle cell anemia, and a host of other diseases. Just because you're poor. There is scientific research on the serotonin levels in your brain and your body that affect how susceptible you are to disease, how happy you are, how long you live, and people who are poor get impacted the most. When coronavirus hits, the poorest people get affected the most. Any other systemic disease hits, poorest people are affected the worst. It's natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes. Poor people are affected the worst. They're affected in worse ways than people who have money. Okay, I live in a beautiful penthouse in an island in Miami. Between, I'm, in, uh, I'm on an island between Miami and Miami Beach. And you know what I do when there's a hurricane coming to Miami? I get on an airplane, I fly to New York City, I get a hotel on Broadway close to the Shake Shack, I book some tickets to a Broadway show, and I, that's my hurricane shelter. Why? Because I have money, I can afford to do that. People who are not wealthy can't afford to do that, right? When, a, earth, when a, 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 a hurricane goes through Haiti or the Dominican, they don't have that option, most of those people. That's a sin. That's a crime. We got to correct that. Now, how do I correct that? I don't fix that by being poor. You don't fix that by being poor. You don't fix that by being a victim. You fix that. By the best thing you can do for the poor, the exploited, the downtrodden is to not be one of them. So please make this commitment to the highest possible version of you. Make this commitment to how you can accept the love, how you can accept the abundance, how you can accept the prosperity. Okay, uh, let me see who we have in the house. I want, last week, I gave you assignment, right? Um, we had several things in the assignment, one of which was to write your um, screenplay of your perfect day, or it was to uh, create your or update your prosperity manifestation map. So I'm looking for a volunteer who's willing to show their prosperity map that they actually did it, or they're willing to read at least a few minutes of this script of their perfect day. So Stefan, is that you? Is that your map you're holding up? Okay, so I'm gonna unmute you. Uh, 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 please unmute yourself. Yes. Hey, well. Okay, can you hold that up again, please? <clears throat> yeah, I try to I try to change the picture up here behind me. Okay, can you share? Don't tell us something that's personal that you don't want out on the interwebs. But is there a little story you can tell us about some of those images of what you're trying to manifest here? Well, I, when you see here uh, the the kids. Okay. Uh, for example, here uh, they want to support them uh, with money that I earn. Okay. Uh, they, and Love that's that. uh, for, that, for this. It's uh, for this reason. It's uh, yeah. It's necessary to be prosperous. 
Okay. There you see, otherwise, uh, here, here a house uh, at by the beach, for example, or the next car. Okay, what is yeah. the next car? I can't see what that is. It's a BMW. BMW. I have BMW? one in white okay. already, but the one in blue would be would be very nice. Yeah. Okay, love it. All right, so that's uh, yeah. all right. Thank you, Stefan. I appreciate that. That's a prosperity manifestation map. Anyone else have one they want to share? Let me look through the other pages. You know, give me a sign, hold up, or click that yellow hand thing. Uh, Paula, uh, you can unmute yourself. What do you want to share with us? Oh, look at that. Let me uh, take out my virtual background so you can see it okay <laughs> this is my project since a lot of months now mm -hmm. it's my travel dreams over here all the places i want to go to so what are a couple of the places oh i want to go to santorini i want to go to brujas to brussels Oh, well, let me see. Uh, I want to go to Ireland. And I this is for my girls to get their German passports because they they have the right to be to the, nat the German nationality. And I need to do that. And this is about my book being a bestseller <laughs> over here somewhere. Tell my them, the, tell, them the title, tell them the title of your book again. Pardon me? Tell them the title of your book again. It's Bulletproof Women. Bulletproof Woman. All right. So that's available now in Spanish. Yes, it is. You guys who speak Spanish or know someone who does, tell them about that book. So that's my that's my dream board. All right. I love it. I love it. Okay, is there anyone who's willing to, who wrote this script of their perfect day uh, that would be willing to read us a little bit of it? Kind of scroll through the pages here, looking for a volunteer. And Agnes, by the way, Agnes Fitzgerald, I'm looking at you. Listen, I love your email that you sent in, um, but let's not affirm that this is going to take months to do the dream board or that it's going to take months to do this script of the perfect day. Okay. We could get that done this week. If you really set your mind to it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Good. I love the thumbs up. Uh, all right. Any volunteer I'm looking one last time going once going twice. All right, so let's move to the offering statement and then I wanna give you your homework. So uh, Paula, can you put up the go page, the link? So as I told you, we do this on a love offering basis. What, uh, you know, I'm looking for you guys to support the work. I, I, the, the idea of this ministry was, I just came to recognize I can't put out five blogs a week and three podcasts a week and two YouTube shows a week and do all of this stuff for free to teach the principles of prosperity and still meet the needs of my clients, the people who, who want to hire me to work with their companies and fly to their events and speak at their events. So I decided to create this as a for-profit ministry to see, okay, people who believe in the work can support the work. And my hope is that if you can only pay $1 a week or $5 a week, then just give that. And I'm, I'm always happy. I see those every week, those donations of $1 or $5 are, are very exciting to me. Some people tithe um, to, the, to the ministry. And, and remember, it's, it's an unchurch. It's not a church. It's not a religion. This is a for-profit. I'm modeling the principles I'm teaching to say, hey, let's see if enlightened people are willing to not only provide for the, to, to be willing to pay for the value, 
that they believe they receive from it, but also support it so that I can just offer it free every week like this for anyone who can't afford it. We say, just watch the show and then share it, you know, share the podcast, share the YouTube show, uh, tell your friends about it and support the work that way until you manifest more prosperity and you can. So um, that's the page where you can do that. You can Venmo it or PayPal it or whatever. And then can we put up the, uh, the offering statement, please, Paula? Uh, I like to bless the tithes and the offerings and the donations every week. Um, and I'm gonna wait for her to put up this up so you guys who want to can affirm it together with me. So bear with us here. You lose the slide, Paula. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, or you, if you go to that Go page, it's written on that page too. Here we go. All right, here's our offering statement. If you want to affirm it with me, prosperity begins with me. Holding the seed offering in my hand or my heart, I send it forth as a vessel of hope, healing, and highest good knowing it blesses myself, the recipient, and the universe around us. And so it is. All right, let's talk about your assignment. Let me see how I'm doing time-wise. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, a couple of thoughts first before I give you the assignment. Two questions I want you to really do some critical thinking on. Number one question. Are you using poverty as a badge, a badge of honor, as like status signaling? Do you, have you been indoctrinated with the belief that it's spiritual or noble to be poor and as a result, you've been hanging on to remaining poor because it, it, you, it gives you a sense of worthiness or you feel it confers an esteemed trait to you by your friends and family because you're you're nobly fighting the forces of wealth and abundance, and you're, you're a stoic soldier of poverty. I want you to really think about that. Question number two, are you using poverty to remain a victim? And going a little deeper, are you getting some kind of emotional payoff by being a victim? And as a result, you're hanging on to victimhood. Because one of the, the, the things that I did for many, many years, I did both these things, by the way. Absolutely. You know, people say, well, how do you think of this stuff? Well, because I lived it. I lived it my whole life, right? I spent the first 30 years of my life in poverty being a professional victim. And in my case, I was so emotionally crippled that I couldn't accept love. So what I chose to do instead was I would use attention for love. So I believe that's what led me to becoming a professional speaker. I couldn't accept love, so I went out in the world seeking standing ovations. I went out in the world seeking affirmation from external sources, seeking other people who could tell me that I was worthy because I didn't believe it myself. And the other thing I did for decades was I lived as a professional victim. And I took, um, I took 
pride in being a victim. One of the things, you know, sometimes I say things that cause people to click off my site immediately or to leave the broadcast immediately and unfriend me and unfollow me on Twitter. And one of the things I say frequently that creates that reaction is I tell people there are no random lives. There are random circumstances, okay? If a meteorite lands on your Bentley, that's a, and you know, that's a random occurrence. But if next week a different meteorite lands on your Lamborghini and the week after that, a third meteorite lands on your Ferrari, we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that you have to be doing something to manifest those results. It is not possible that three random meteorites from the solar system have found three exotic automobiles in your driveway. <laughs> that, the, that ain't happening, Bubba. Okay. So let's, let's get, okay. And, you know, same thing. If you're, oh God, I hate to say this because I don't want to, you know, I'm not here to call. Yeah, I am here to call people out. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to embrace this role of being the villain. Okay. When you're manifesting an illness for the fourth and fifth and sixth time, we have to look at that. When, you know, you know, after 11 negative dysfunctional relationships in a row, I kind of finally had to say, hey, was there one person who's always at the scene of the crime? And that person was not my 11 different partners. That person was me. Right. So um, we've got to come to grips with that. And, and so in my case, being a victim gave me that emotional payoff because I couldn't accept love. So I could accept sympathy instead. And I needed that love so desperately, but I couldn't accept it. So I needed to manufacture sympathy, sympathy. So I kept subconsciously, you never do this consciously. So of course you recoil when I suggest it. Of course you deny it immediately. Of course you think I'm crazy for even suggesting it. But that's the truth is you create additional scenarios where people will feel sorry for you because you desperately need that sympathy because you're using it as a substitute for the love that you can't accept. So um, ask yourself, are you wearing poverty as a badge of honor are you using poverty to wallow in victimhood? All right, let me give you your, your assignment for this week. And you see, we, we, there is a test the next week. We do check in on people. So you better do this homework because you don't want to get caught with the dog ate your homework excuse. That ain't going to work in this broadcast, all right? Uh, here's your assignment. Define how and why you are committing a sin when you are living in lack or limitation. Somebody type that in the chat, please. Define how and why you are committing a sin when you're living in lack or limitation. And I really do mean it. I want some people to check in next week and, and, and where you really have to find that to yourself, how that plays out with you. And even more importantly, because again, our goal here is not, my goal here isn't to make you feel bad about yourself. My goal here is not to beat you up. My goal is not to show you up. My goal is to help you break through to the other side. And so not only do we want to know how you're committing a sin when you're living in lack, but we want to know why 
you are committing a sin when you're living in lack. What has been the payoff up until this point, which has caused you to keep repeating that scenario? All right. Thank you every week for watching. Again, your other homework is share the show, the podcast, the YouTube show, get on social media. Next week, same bat time, same bat channel. And the topic, we're going to go deeper into this topic of struggle, illness, disease, poverty, addiction, dysfunctional relationships, lack of money, lack of material things. And we're going to go deep into the topic of overcoming to become. And that's what we're going to do that next week. So peace, love, and unicorns from Miami. I will see you all again next week. Peace.